excited to be at church today? I am. Welcome to Vox Church, all that are joining us at various locations and online. New Haven, can we just put our hands together and say good morning to our whole church? We love you, church. Welcome. You're joining us on all of our various platforms. Thanks for being a part of church today. We've been in a teaching series called Headspace. This is part six. We're going to do eight weeks on this topic. This idea that the thoughts, that the feelings, the desires that are floating around in your mind create for you an atmosphere. Right, But behind those thoughts, behind those feelings, there is a story. A story that every one of us has internalized about where did we come from and what's gone wrong with the world and what can be done to fix it. And some of us have identified that story and then others of us, that story is kind of living in the background of our minds without us even realizing it. But what we've been focusing on these last five weeks is that the story you believe about the world, about where you came from, it really does set the trajectory of your life. And so it's an incredibly important thing to allow God to inform that story. And so we've been looking at the life of Daniel. And today we're going to be in Daniel chapter 6. We're going to drop right in, in the middle of maybe the most famous story in the book of Daniel, the story of Daniel and the lion's den. But in verse 10, it says this, Now when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the, windows, where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. Three times a day he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God just as he had done before. If you want to jot some notes down, title of the sermon is Free to Love. Free to Love. If you don't mind, would you turn to the person to your left or to your right and tell them, God has called you to be free to love. Come on, tell them that. God has called you. Now turn to the person you neglected the, on the other side and tell, God has also called you. Come on, tell them, God has also called you. Even though I chose you second, he loves you still. To be free to love. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for Jesus. God, I really do believe that today is the day where lives and hearts are changed. So all of us open up our hearts and we say, God, would you change me? Would you draw me closer to Jesus Christ today? And would you help me to have eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart to receive? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Freedom. Freedom, freedom, freedom. You can't live in America very long and not hear all about freedom, right? Freedom really is the centerpiece of our culture. We talk about it all the time. We value it above all else, it seems. Freedom, you know, and if you know the stories that Americans tell about America, you know that they're all based on freedom. You hear about the pilgrims who came to America so that they could worship freely. You hear about the founding fathers who started this nation and it was for freedom that they fought that they bled and that many of them died. And then you look at our history in the Civil War where we fought for the freedom of all people because we had a nation that promised freedom but did not fully deliver on that freedom. And so though our freedoms have been imperfect still to this day, I think it's safe to say that America, really at the center of our identity, is this idea that we value freedom. We value freedom, but physical freedom is obviously critical, right? We all value the fact that we are physically free, that you're not a slave to another person. But there's more to freedom than just physical freedom. I think that that's obvious, right? Things like freedom of speech or freedom of expression, things like freedom of thought. What about freedom on the inside? If you look at your life today, would you say that you are fully free? Or are there things maybe on the outside or the inside that are hindering your freedom? I was reading recently about Ernest Hemingway. You're probably familiar with him. One of the great authors and writers of a previous generation, the early 1900s. Hemingway was incredibly successful for his writing, won a Nobel Prize, won a Pulitzer Prize, countless other awards, became very, very wealthy because of his success as a writer. And Hemingway got a reputation as a womanizer, going from woman to woman to woman, using women for his own pleasure. He also became famous for being a man's man, a hunter. He would go after the biggest fish and the biggest animals on planet earth and try to capture or kill them and he became incredibly famous for these exploits he had homes all over the place had a great ranch in Idaho that he would go and retreat to but also homes in New York City and Paris and Venice he was wealthy had a big yacht that he would take all of his friends out on and yet through it all he seemed to struggle with a sense of emptiness he once said life is a journey from nothingness 
to nothingness. This was Hemingway's view of the world. And so he decided that he would suck all the pleasure out of life, that he would suck the marrow out of life, and that he would maximize his own gains and pleasure so that he could find true freedom. And by age 61, Ernest Hemingway was on his fourth marriage, and he found himself frustrated and lonely. And so he enacted what he believed his last great act of freedom. Rather than allowing fate to decide the time of his death, he took his favorite rifle, put the butt of the gun on the floor, put the barrel of the gun in his mouth, and one of the greatest writers in American history pulled the trigger and ended his own life in an act of what he considered somehow to be freedom. Is that what it means to be free? I don't think too many of us hear that story and think that Ernest Hemingway found great freedom in his life. Some of us think about freedom as options, right? We're all about options. And we live in a world that really does exalt this idea of options. You think, if I have more options, then I'm truly free. And so I don't know if you even remember this, but there was a day where you could go into a store and order coffee and get coffee. But today, you go into a store and you've got options, right? It's not just coffee. You want an Americano, you want a Pike's Place, you want decaf, you want blonde rose. What do you want? And then you, you can put all sorts of things in it. You don't just put cream in it. You can put milk in it. You can put almond milk in it. You can put coconut milk in it. You can put soy milk in it. Which one do you want? And if you want to sweeten your coffee, it's not just about sugar, no sugar. No, 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 no. You got monk fruit. You got Splenda. You got Stevia. You got honey. You got a thousand assortments of sugars because we want options. And most of us hear that and we think, well, that's the way it should be in life, right? Like, we want options that makes us feel like we're more free and so you sit down with a friend or with your spouse and you put on Netflix and there are 4,000 films on Netflix right now but after five minutes of scrolling through your options you look at your spouse or your friend and you say there's nothing on right I don't, there's nothing to watch there's literally nothing you go in your closet shirt after shirt after shirt pair of pants after pair of pants pair of shoes after shoes and then you go I have nothing to wear I have nothing. I have absolutely nothing to wear. I don't think that options alone makes us free. I don't think that having more options really does secure a sense of freedom. You know, Americans are really big on this idea of autonomy, right? We think that freedom means that I have to have the removal of all constraints in my life, right? Nothing can hinder my decision making. What I think goes and what I want is what I can pursue. And so to really be free is to think what I want to think and to do what I want to do. That's what freedom is. And people leave me alone. I'm autonomous. I am an autonomous self. And that makes me free. German philosopher Immanuel Kant said it like this. He said, the enlightened human being is someone who trusts in his or her own power of thinking. Trust in your own power of thinking rather than in authority or tradition. By the way, this has become the air we breathe. This is what we have internalized as a concept of freedom in our world today. That my own thinking is more important than tradition. My own thinking is more important than authority. And so we live in a world that rejects anything that would infringe upon my autonomy. And this leads to a lot of conclusions that many of us, whether we realize it or not, have come to because it's just the way people think today. We think that individual reason takes precedent over any moral authority. And so when we read the Bible, we don't often read it as an authority over our lives. We're, it's more, we're more prone to read it as a menu of choices. Well, I like this, but I don't like that. I'll take this, but I won't take that because I decide what's right and wrong for me. We think that our individual desires take precedent even over nature. And so if nature says that this person is male or this person is female, we've created a culture that says, no, we can override nature, right? And we can bend nature to the reality that we feel on the inside. This has become our normal way of thinking. We think that commitments that we make to another person or to a group of people like a church or a community, those commitments are dependent upon our personal fulfillment within the commitment. And so two people get married, and we hear this all the time, right? And then they get divorced because, well, she wasn't happy. Well, he wasn't happy because it seems normal that if I'm not happy, I have the right to end the commitment, right? And so some of you are like, well, my pastor is not making me happy right now, so I think I'm going to be ending my commitment. No, I hope not. But, uh, but this is the way we think, and we do it all in the name of freedom. We do it all in a pursuit 
of being more free. But I think the ironic thing that most of us would acknowledge is that when we look around at our friends and our neighbors, at the famous people on planet Earth today and the poor and everybody in between, I think it's obvious that the vast majority of people don't seem to be living in a great sense of freedom with a great internal freedom that brings fulfillment and fullness in life. It seems that with all of our freedoms, we somehow are becoming not more free, but less free. So what if our perspective on freedom, what if our view of freedom is actually creating the constraints that we're trying to avoid? What if the way we see freedom is actually producing a new captivity in our time? I love what Dr. Tim Keller says about this. He says, modern people like to see freedom as the complete absence of all constraints, right? That's pretty normal. But think of a fish. Come on, think with me of a fish. Because a fish absorbs oxygen from water, not air. It's free only if it's restricted to the water. If a fish is freed from the river and put on the grass to explore, its freedom to move and soon even to live is destroyed. The fish is not more free but less free if it cannot honor the reality of its nature. The same is true in many areas of life. Freedom is not so much the absence of restrictions as finding the right ones, those that fit with the realities of our own nature and those of the world around us. And so somehow in our minds, our concept of freedom has often become misconstrued so that we find ourselves trying to be free and we end up like a fish on the banks of the sea, gasping for air in the midst of our pursuit of freedom. And you might find yourself there even right now. You're autonomous in your relationships. Nobody relies on you and you don't rely on anybody. You've got enough money in the bank to feel comfortable and secure, but it always would be nice to have a little bit more, to feel a little bit more comfortable and secure. You've established yourself as a successful person in a variety of different ways, and yet as you've climbed the ladder, you're not discovering a greater sense of freedom, but a lesser sense of freedom. What is wrong with our concept of freedom? In Daniel chapter 6, I love this story. It's a well-known story about Daniel who stands up for his faith. He gets thrown in a lion's den, and God supernaturally protects him from getting eaten by lions, right? Amazing story. Even as a little kid, you may have heard it. There's like David and Goliath, and then there's like Daniel and the lion's den. These are like the, the ones that people hear about, you know? And so most of us have at some level heard about this story, but today I want to look at it as a contrast, all right? A contrast between two concepts of freedom. On the one hand, you have King Darius, who is powerful and wealthy. In those days, as the king of Persia, his word was as the word of God, okay? He was the ultimate authority on all things. Whatever he said, it became law. He was more free than probably any of us will ever be in the physical sense. He could do whatever he wanted to do. Any pleasure, any desire, anything that he pursued, it was his. And then on the other side, you have Daniel. A man who was taken from his homeland and made a captive in Babylon, later conquered by Persia. And we're told that Daniel serves as a governor to King Darius. And he becomes the most successful governor in all of the empire. And so Darius is going to elevate him to the highest position where the whole kingdom is under Daniel's control. But before he can do that, other governors become jealous of Daniel. And so they hatch a plot to catch Daniel in his commitment to God. And they go to the king and they say, King, we believe that a great unifying time should occur in our nation, in Persia. And what we'd like to do is we've all discussed it and all the governors are in agreement that we should take 30 days. And for 30 days, everyone should only worship and pray to you, O king, because you're so great and you're so majestic. It'll unite all the people from various different lands and communities all under the name of King Darius and we'll all worship you for 30 days. And if anybody doesn't do this, we'll throw him into a lion's den. And Darius, it seems, hardly even listens to their option or their opportunity, their suggestion. He goes, all right, fine. And he signs it. And now it's law. The word of the king has been spoken for 30 days. Nobody can worship anywhere or anyone other than the king. What he hadn't thought through was that Daniel was a committed Jew and that no matter who said what, Daniel was going to worship his God. And so without knowing it, Darius has gotten tripped up in his own words, and now he's going to execute his best governor. And he has to. He seems that he has to because he's been tangled up in his own commitment. How did he become blinded by the manipulation of his governors so easily? I think part of it 
is what happens on the inside of the human heart when we begin believing that I'm smarter than God. When we start thinking that my reason, like Immanuel Kant said, my reason is the highest source of truth that can be found. When we start operating from that perspective, a pride inflates our hearts and it blinds us to what's really happening around us. And so Darius couldn't recognize the manipulation of his governors. And before he knew it, he's surrounded by a bunch of people who are only out to steal and rob his authority. And he finds himself trapped in his own words. And Darius, as the free, ultimate power in Persia, starts to unravel. Look at verse 18 when he throws Daniel into the lion's den. Look at it says, it says, Then the king returned to his palace. Daniel's sitting in a den of lions, right? Darius is sitting in his palace. And he spent the night. Look how the king, who has everything at his fingertips, spends the night. He spent the night without eating, without any entertainment being brought to him, and he could not sleep. So here's this guy who's got it all, and yet food doesn't fulfill him. Entertainment just sounds like noise. And there's a restlessness in his heart. He's frustrated. He's anxious. He's jealous. He's bitter. He's playing out all the scenarios in his mind. You ever done this? And he's laying in bed, and he's going, I just got to get some sleep. I just got to get some sleep and move on. And yet as he tries the left side, doesn't work. He flips over, tries the right side, doesn't work. He lays on his back for a little while, doesn't work. Does the tummy, doesn't work. He tries every different position. It's not working. He props his back up. He does all these different things. He can't seem to catch a wink of sleep. Something's going on in his mind that just won't slow down. And so, you know, Darius takes his white noise machine and puts it on. Just like you do when you can't fall asleep. You know, it's like, all right, that's going to help. He lays down, that doesn't help. So then he tries the waves. You know the waves? You know, I like the waves. You know, my kids are really annoying me. I crank up the white noise machine and the waves. Whoosh, I'm at the beach, you know. You know, like he gets you. So, and so he tries that. That doesn't work. He says, okay, let me have a little melatonin. He tries a little melatonin at night. And that doesn't work. He says, oh, let me, let me take a sleeping pill. Let me drink some alcohol. All the different strategies, all the different ways you've tried to quiet that voice in your heart, that voice in your mind that's just running and running and running and running. And you can't seem to sleep because you can't slow it down. Here's Darius, the most free man on the planet. And yet he's all tangled up on the inside. He's got it all, but he can't sleep. And I think a lot of us, you know, entertain the myth that if I just had a little more, then I'd be free. If I just had a little more flexibility in my job, then I'd really feel free inside. If I just had a little bit more opportunity ahead of me, then I'd really feel free. But maybe your life doesn't need a little more opportunity, a little more flexibility. Maybe the problem is a whole lot deeper than that. Maybe the whole concept of freedom and what you've been looking for is flawed because your freedom... I love you. Jesus has a wonderful plan for your life. Your freedom is all about you. Look how Paul describes a broken concept of freedom in Galatians 5. This is the message translation. It's awesome. It says, it's obvious the kind of life that develops out of trying to get your own way all the time. Now, I know that this doesn't apply to anybody in the room, but just think about your spouse, okay? <laughs> just think about your friend. Think about the person that this does apply to because uh, it might apply to them. He says, it's obvious what kind of life develops. That was a joke. It applies to you and me. Out of trying to get your own way all the time. Here's what he describes. Repetitive, loveless, cheap sex. A stinking accumulation of mental and emotional garbage. Frenzied and joyless grabs for happiness. Trinket gods. Magic show religion. Paranoid loneliness. That's somebody today. Cutthroat competition. All-consuming yet never satisfied wants. A brutal temper. An impotence to love and be loved. Divided homes, divided lives. Small-minded, lopsided pursuits. I love this. The vicious habit of depersonalizing everyone into a rival. Uncontrolled, uncontrollable addictions. Ugly parodies of community. I could go on. This isn't the first time I've warned you, you know. If you, check this out, if you use your freedom this way, you will not inherit God's kingdom. Question for you. Do you see any of this in your experience? In your personal concept of what it means to be free? Do you see any of this? Because what we find in experience is the more self-focused we become, the more enslaved to our own freedoms we find ourselves. So think about it like this. Darius is a king living in a castle, right? And Daniel is a slave living in a pit. 
And which man that night was more free? So Daniel gives us this contrast, a very different type of freedom. Obviously on the outside, he's been thrown into a lion's den, not looking so good physically for his freedom. But on the inside, he is living by a very different standard, a very different way of thinking about freedom. Notice first in the verse that we read, his openness. We're told that when he goes to pray in his upper room, his windows are wide open. Now, this is not primarily an act of insurrection or rebellion. It to, it, we're told that he always did this, that his windows were always open. In other words, check this out, Daniel lived a radically open life. He was the same person in the palace that he was at home. He was open about who he is. He was open about what he believed. He was open about, you know, how he valued himself and the world. He didn't have to prove himself. He didn't have to posture. He wasn't carrying around this sense of shame. He wasn't always trying to put on a best face for people. Daniel was free. Think about it. He was open on the inside. And just contrast that to so many of our experiences. We're always trying to look our best, always trying to prove that we're worth it, always trying to, you know, live up to somebody else's standards. Daniel was just open. He lived an open life, but that wasn't it. He was also radically submitted. Did you notice that three times a day he stopped working to pray? Three times a day he valued prayer so much that he would go home and pray in the middle of his day. It was his highest priority to connect with God. His highest priority to know that he was in line with God's heartbeat for that day. Consider how serious Daniel took prayer. From Daniel's perspective, not praying for a day was more dangerous than being eaten by lions. Think about that. That's how serious he was about prayer. He was submitted. So he was open. He was submitted. He's, he's painting for us a different picture of freedom. He was open. He was submitted. Another crazy thing that I noticed about Daniel in this little passage is that he was thankful. Did you notice that? It says that he went and he prayed and then it said he gave thanks. And this one kind of blew my mind because think about Daniel's predicament. Here he is, a slave in a foreign land, separated from his family, living in service to crazy, ungodly kings, and now he's getting thrown in a lion's den for something that he shouldn't even be in trouble for. And yet, in the midst of it, he's on his knees, and if you could hear him praying, you would hear him saying, oh God, I'm just so grateful. God, I'm just thankful. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God, for your grace. Maybe he didn't know Jesus' name. Thank you, God for your amazing kindness. Maybe he did, he was a prophet. Thank you, God, for all your love. Thank you for all your patience with me. Thank you, God, for your goodness. And most of us would like sneak up next to him and be like, hey, Dan, things are pretty bad right now for you. Like you're about to get thrown into a den with lions. Like maybe you should be upset with God. And yet that's not what we find at all. And somehow we're upset with God because of a flat tire. We're upset with God because we didn't get the job we wanted. We're upset with God because that girl broke up with us. We become upset with God for all kinds of things. And yet here's Daniel living by a different code, free and thankful. And the last thing I noticed about Daniel's freedom is it was personal. He says this, he says, Daniel prayed giving thanks to his God. He didn't just pray giving thanks to God. He gave thanks to his God. And I think if you could ask Daniel the secret to his prayer life, the secret to his perspective, he would look at you and say, you know, you don't understand. This is personal for me. Me and God, we we have history. I, I know him. I love him. It's not just an idea for me. It's not just a religion for me. It's not just a theology for me. It's real for me. This God that I've been talking to and worshiping that I get on my knees to sing about, this God that I've been saying is so good and telling him that I'm grateful, he knows me and I know him. It is personal. It is real. And that's why I'm so thankful. That's why I'm so submitted. That's why my life's so open because I have relationship with him. Wow, what a powerful freedom that Daniel had. Now, what's the difference between these two men, between Darius and Daniel? Why is one so tangled up and bound and another so free, though their outer experiences are so radically different? Friend, it's the story that they believed that set the trajectory of their life. See, Darius believed that his word was like God's word. He elevated his own opinion and desires above everything and everyone else. And yet Daniel had radically tethered his life to a different story. See, the scripture tells us that external freedom is important, but internal freedom is even more important. And no human being has internal freedom in their natural state. Sin has bound 
bound up our hearts. We have been separated from God because of unhealthy attachments that our souls naturally are inclined to create. And so every one of us creates gods out of good things and out of bad things. We seek to have personal freedom, but in our pursuit of it, we actually deify the thing we pursue. And so you might be passionate about your career, but before you know it, your career begins to control your life and you're neglecting your kids and neglecting your spouse for all for the sake of your career because it's become for you a God. Some of us, it's lust that begins to control us. At first, it's just an attraction, but then it becomes all consuming. And before we know it, we can't stop and we find ourselves looking at these pictures and pursuing this thing and wrapped up in an addiction that we can't control. Lust taking control of our hearts, unable to stop, unable to draw a line because that thing that we pursued began to control us. For some of us, it's approval. You just wanted your dad to tell you you did a good job. You just wanted your boss to say, well done, but now you're obsessed with what they think. And every time you walk in, you say, well, do they like this shirt? Did I look good today? Did I do it right? Did I say it right? Is it all good? You're consumed with the approval of this other person. Your fears can become enslaving. Your goals can become enslaving. All of those things become gods to us idols in our own heart. What the scripture teaches is that every one of us in this room, we're enslaved to something. We become enslaved to something. That no one is in fact truly free, but that each of us is a slave to sin. Now along with this story, along with this picture, the Bible also promises the most radical freedom of any sacred text ever written by human beings. Anyone who ever jotted down a single note no one has ever written words like the New Testament writes about our freedom. We're told in the New Testament that we have opportunity to obtain a profound and powerful freedom unlike anything else the world has ever offered. In Galatians chapter 5, it says you are, I love it, you are called to be free. Called to be free. In John 8, 32, it says you'll know the truth. And knowing that truth will set you free. In 2 Corinthians 3, it says where the Spirit of the Lord is, wherever that Spirit is, and I believe He's here today, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And Jesus says it so powerfully in John 8, 36. He says, if the Son sets you free, come on, you know it, you are free Indeed, you're not just free on the outside. You're not just free to make choices. You have a whole different sense of freedom, a whole different opportunity for freedom. And see, Daniel's life, this prophet, he was a prophetic picture pointing us to a life of true freedom, modeling it for us, but also pointing us towards it. See, every day when he opened up his uh, window and prayed, he aimed his prayers towards Jerusalem. This was an important tradition for the Jews in exile because they believed that Jerusalem was the place of the holy temple. And the holy temple had within it the holy of holies. And the holy of holies was a sacred place where the very presence of God met with humanity in a divine collision, the sacred, divine, perfect God visiting human beings on planet earth, heaven and earth kissing and touching in one place. And so Daniel's life in his prayer pointing towards Jerusalem is actually showing us the true temple because Jesus Christ told us in the scriptures in the New Testament that he was in fact the temple of God when he said destroy this temple and in three days I will rise again and raise it from the ground what he was trying to teach us is I am in fact the place of the holy of holies where heaven and earth touch I am that sacred union between divinity and humanity I am the temple and if you will just aim your life at me you will find a great freedom than the world could ever offer you otherwise. This is the power that Jesus is trying to reveal to us. And so the New Testament gives us an example or a path towards freedom. What is that path? First, Christ came to identify with us. Stay with me. Identify with us. Now, this is one of the more confusing elements of the New Testament. If you read the New Testament, you'll find that all throughout the New Testament, it makes these strange connections between us and Christ. It says you were crucified with Christ. It says you died with Christ. It says you rose with Christ. And you are now seated with Christ in heavenly places. If you just circle the places that it says in Christ and with Christ, in Him and with Him in the New Testament, you'll find that there are dozens of dozens of dozens of these connections that the writers are making. What does it mean? What does all this in Him, with Him stuff means? 
It means that through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, God has tethered Himself to you in order to change your position before Him forever. So now, you're united with Jesus' past. I know this is a strange idea, but spiritual thoughts go beyond the natural mind, so try to stay with me. Now you're tethered to Jesus' past. In other words, whatever happened to Jesus in the past, according to God, if you put your faith in Him, now happened to you. And so when Jesus Christ lived a blameless and perfect life, God sees it as though you lived a blameless and perfect life because Christ represents you in His coming. Now when Jesus died for the sins of the world, bled and suffered the way of sin placed on his shoulders, the wickedness and brokenness and pain of sin planted in his heart and released like an atom bomb inside of him, crying out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When Jesus took the wrath of God for sin, God sees it as though you died for sin in Christ. You already have paid the debt for sin that you deserve to pay because of your sinfulness when Christ died in your place. And then when he rose from the dead and he took on new life, resurrection life. God saw you in that resurrection so that when he sat down in the right hand of the Father, the place of acceptance, authority, and power, he sees you in Christ sitting down with him in that position. This is the mystery. But here's the crazy thing, and this is what I think so many Christians miss, is that you're not just united to Christ's past, you're also united in Christ's future. And so for those who place their faith in Christ, who aim their prayers towards Jerusalem, the true temple, Jesus himself, those who do that, who turn to Christ, who behold him, who look to him for salvation, when we do that, the spirit of Jesus comes and takes up residence in our own hearts. He washes our sins away. Our righteousness is given to Christ and Christ's righteousness is given to us. He imputes his perfection upon our account and then we stand blameless before him, alive in him because the resurrection of Jesus, the new life of another age, the next season of human history where Christ returns and makes all things new, that future already already lives in you now. And this is the secret of freedom for those in Christ, that you can live in the power of the resurrected self, in the power free from the bondage of sin, in the power of united with God, perfect and blameless in his sight. You can live in that reality now because inside you dwells eternal life. What a mystery. What a wonder. And there's something in our hearts when we hear about the good news of the gospel that our hearts say, wow, yes, I believe that, I receive that. But then there's another part of us, and let's just be honest, when we hear about being blameless in God's sight, when we hear about being perfect in his perspective, when we say that we are completely, fully, and forever received, there's a part of us that goes, all right, well, let's not take it too far, right? I mean... If we take that too far and say we're completely blameless, then what's stopping anyone from going out and living however they want to live? What's stopping Christians from just running around and living in sin and saying, well, I'm forgiven, everything's right? And so what we do in response to that concern is we create man-made religion, right? And man-made religion says, all right, well, God loves you, but you better be good. And if you don't obey him, he's going to reject you. So you better obey him or you'll get rejected by God. And so most of us live with an attitude that says, well, God loves me as long as I don't mess it up. And if I do mess it up, then I'll probably be on the outside for a while, I'll have to live in the doghouse, and then I'll kind of make my way back in and receive his forgiveness. And, and you kind of go through this cycle in your life, always afraid that maybe this time you pushed it a little too far, and you'll be on the outside for good. Friend, that's what religion teaches. Do you know, I don't know, want to know what the gospel teaches? Because it's far more offensive and far more extraordinary. The gospel does not say, obey God or else he'll reject you. The gospel says, obey God because he'll never reject you. Obey God because he's promised that no matter what, he won't forsake you. Obey God because you are blameless regardless of your record, past, present, or future. And when we hear that truth, 
rockets go off in our mind. Like, wait a minute, wait a minute. What, what, what is that? What is that? What, what do I do with that? It feels like it violates my sense of right and wrong. It feels like it, it, it scrambles my... What is that? Friend, you know what the Scripture calls that? A word we're very familiar with, but we've lost its meaning. The Scripture calls it love. Look how Paul wrestles with it in Romans 8. He says, what then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, consider how radical what Paul says here is. Who can be against us? If God is for us, and he is, that's the whole point he's making, then, then, then who can be against us? If he did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously? Look at the words he uses. Give us all things. Wait a minute. Who can bring any charge, any charge, any condemning charge against those whom God has chosen? It's God who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Look at those next two words. No one. No one. Do you see it? See, something starts to change. This is the essence of Christian holiness. Something starts to change in the heart when a believer understands that you're never going to be rejected, that you're never going to be forsaken, that you're never going to be cast out. Something starts to change on the inside when the love of God gets in there, when the love of God gets to turn the, nev the levers and shift the way you feel. All of a sudden, you're no longer obeying God out of fear of rejection. You're no longer obeying God because you have to the love of God takes hold of your heart and you begin to obey God because you want to. You begin to obey God because you love Him. You begin to obey God because you've been overwhelmed by His goodness and by His grace. And something changes in the way you see God's commands. Don't miss this. Because for too long, followers of Jesus have seen God's commands and seen them as ways that God limits my freedom and pleasure. But when you discover the grace of Jesus, you realize that God's commands never limit. They only liberate. That God's commands were never put in place to rob you of pleasure or freedom, but actually to maximize your life with pleasure and freedom. This is what Jesus was going after in John 15. Look at He says, when you obey my commands, you remain in my love. Just as I obey my Father's commands, I remain in His love. I've told you these things so that you'll be burdened and heavy laden with multiple opportunities to fail and always feel rejected. No, that's not what He says. I've told you these things. Here's my motive. That you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. Here's the secret of real freedom that we find in Christ. That sacred limits bring life. Sacred limits bring life. When I joyfully embrace the commands of God, when I gladly surrender to the will of God, when I happily pursue the moral code outlined by God, I don't find less, I find more. Sacred limits bring life. It's always been His intention for you to experience the fullness of joy. But this takes a step of faith. You have to actually step out and believe this. And you know what happens? Stay with me. You know what happens? when you radically surrender to God's limits rather than your own thinking? You know what happens when you reject the Darius way of freedom and you say, you know what? Freedom's not about what I want. Freedom is radical surrender to Christ. That true freedom is slavery to God. And not being surrendered to God actually leads to bondage and slavery. True freedom is radical surrender. When you do that, you know what your life begins to reflect? The prophetic picture that Daniel displays for us you start to experience an openness where you're not defined by your shame anymore, where you don't have to posture and prove that you're worth something. An open life, an open window, because you know you're loved by God. And you start to exhibit a surrender that's not coerced or forced, but joyful. You desire God's will because you know it's best, because you know He's good. And then a gratitude starts to grow. That regardless of your circumstances, you rejoice in the Lord always because you know that you have a God that is for you and whether you're in the palace or the prison, He'll be with you and He'll stand by your side. And not a moment of your life will be stolen if you trust Him. 
Because the gospel, like Daniel, he's your God. It's become personal. Is that your experience? Because it can be. I love how Paul describes it in Galatians 5. Look at it. He says, it's absolutely clear. God has called you, hear this today, to a free life. Just make sure you don't use this freedom as an excuse to do whatever you want to do and destroy your freedom. Rather, use your freedom, check it out, to serve one another. That's how freedom grows. But what happens when we live God's way? Look at it. He brings gifts into our lives. Have you experienced this? Because you can. He brings gifts into our lives much the same way the fruit appears in an orchard. Things like affection for others, exuberance about life, serenity. We develop a, check this out, a willingness to stick with things, a sense of compassion in the heart, and a conviction that a basic holiness permeates things and people. We find ourselves involved in loyal commitments, not needing to force our way in life, able to marshal and direct our energies wisely. In other words, when you surrender radically to Jesus, every area, at every moment, you're not bound. You're free to love. You're free to love. That's the type of freedom that your heart longs for. And that's the type of freedom that God wants to teach his people. Free indeed. Would you stand with me? All of our locations. Everybody that's joining us. I want to invite you into a moment of personal reflection. Maybe you're here today and you've been really honestly following the myth of our culture in regards to freedom. You've said, well, I'll pick and choose from God's truth the things that fit me best. You say, well, I like this, but I don't like that. Constructing a God that looks more like you than the God of the scriptures. Friends, you'll never find freedom that way. You'll never find freedom that way. There'll always be a restlessness, always be a sleeplessness. There'll always be a brokenness because you need to come to a place of surrender to Christ. And if that's you today, even as we sing, I want to urge you to surrender your life afresh to God. Maybe there's a part of your life that you've been unwilling to surrender and God brought you here today so that you could surrender that part of your life to him. I feel like there's somebody in the room, God's talking to you right now. Don't ignore him. Surrender that part of your life. Give him that relationship. Give him that career path that you've so deified in your own heart. Surrender. What if he has a different plan? Are you going to fight against that plan? Or are you going to find your lane in him? Who gets to be the king of your heart? I want to urge you to surrender to God right now. But then there's somebody in the room today that you would say, Justin, I so badly want to be free, but I'm so tangled up. I'm tangled up with thoughts of fear. I'm tangled up with thoughts of anxiety. I'm tangled up. I mean, I believe in Jesus. I love him. But, but if I'm honest, I'm not, I don't feel free. On the inside, I feel like I'm a tangled mess. I feel like a ball of rubber bands all trapped and intertwined. I can't, I can't seem to get out of this. And I'm not sure what I should do. Friend, what you need to do is you need to systematically and intentionally replace the deeper story you've been believing about life with the story of the good news of God's grace. The story of what he's done for you. That in Christ you've already been forgiven of your sin. That in Christ you're blameless. That in Christ you are loved, seated in heavenly places, on your way to heaven with him for eternity. That he has peace for you that is his peace because he sees you as he sees his own son. And as you internalize that story, you'll experience the freedom that the gospel promises. Think of it like this. In America in 1865, the United States passed a law that, that slavery was now illegal. But every one of us knows that the day after that law was passed, the effects and the reality of slavery did not disappear. Slave holders still acted like they had slaves. And former slaves still often lived with a slave mentality. See, slavery had intertwined with the way that they live. And even though the law was passed, the world didn't change overnight. So it is with Christ. He has decreed over you freedom. He has given you the glorious promise of grace, which makes you free forever. And yet we still have this mindset that we hold on to. And so you must take the truth of what he decreed and speak it over your life. And as you do, the Spirit of God will do a work and he'll set you free. And so I want to pray today that there's a turning point moment in your life.
that whatever would be binding you today, whatever anxiety, whatever fear, whatever battle goes on on the inside or the outside, that today God would give you supernatural spiritual sight that would lead to openness to him, submission, gratitude, and a personal encounter. Will you pray that with me today? Come on, let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you that where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. I thank you for the truth of your gospel and the power of Jesus Christ that resides in this room right now. You know every story. You know every detail from every person in the room. And so I pray, Spirit of Jesus, give us spiritual sight. Give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart to receive from the very life of God today. I pray that the things that have bound us up, that the condemnation, the shame, all the things that have entangled us, that today would be a day where those shackles fall off in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray that even as we worship you, that the Spirit of Jesus would do the work that no man could do, that you would work in the invisible realm, and that you would deliver your people from oppression even right now. I speak your life and your freedom as we surrender and trust you in Jesus' name. Come on, let's sing. Hey, thanks for taking a few minutes to join us for Church Online today. Before we let you go, I wanna take just a couple of minutes to talk to you about the condition of your soul. You might be watching this today and you find yourself far from God. I wanna tell you that you don't have to be, that there's a God who loves you, and that he came in the person of Jesus Christ to reconcile you to himself to wash away your sins and to make your heart new. See, when Jesus Christ came on the cross and died, he became the substitutionary sacrifice for your sin and mine. This means that the blood of Christ has washed away your sins so that you can be at peace with God forever. But he didn't stay dead. Three days after Christ died, he rose from the dead. And he did that to bring you new life, to take his living spirit place it in your heart and give you eternal life. Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and life more abundantly. And so if you're listening to this right now and you're battling with fear, you find yourself struggling with anxiety or depression, you find yourself at a place where you're not at peace with God, would you pray with me right now and open your heart to Christ? Say, Jesus, today I give you my life. I believe you died for my sin and rose from the dead. Come into my heart. Be my king. I place my trust in you. If you've opened your heart to Christ today, I want to urge you to text Jesus to the number on the screen. I am so thankful to be able to be with you right now, and I believe that the best is yet to come for your future. God bless you.